welcome back again to Quilt Along with John. Tonight, I am very, very excited. I'm able to bring you the lovely Lisa Chandler all the way from Australia. Lisa, good morning. Well, it's good morning for me, but good evening to you. Good evening. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? I'm really good, darling. How are you? Look at that wall of loveliness behind you. I did you a, wall. I did you a little promo wall. I couldn't help myself. I thought you, you deserved a promo wall. Oh, I think you so, are um, so I tried bloody to come talented. Stop it. Look at all of that. Is that a little pair of shoes in there as well? Yes, yes. Do you want to see the shoes? Yeah, of course. Um, a friend, so a customer friend of mine, she she covers things. And we had a challenge last year on uh, making things with uh, Melbourne under the Australian sun. Look at that. Aren't they just sensational? So she I let me have them. them, and it's quite funny. I think I think to wear them, John, um, I would have to have those walking those walking sticks <laughs> with the height on them. And she's very funny. Um, her friends and her do the shoes all the time, and they're very radical. They go into the op shops and ask, "Have you got any stripper shoes?" <laughs> I've just got this image of when we see you at festival next, you'll be prancing around in your stripper shoes. <laughs> my size and I said to her can I just just keep them up if I ever wear them I'll have to be posed holding on to onto something so I don't fall over I'm gonna see if Natasha's got a stripper pole somewhere we can bring to the Ritter festival and have a little moment for you <laughs> first of all I'm not putting Natasha in them she'll end up eight foot won't she she's so oh, that tall. would fit Natasha's little toe what are you talking about <laughs> she's so tall <laughs> Uh, so where in Australia are you based? So we are down south, as they say in the US. So I'm in Victoria, in Melbourne. So if you have a look at your map, Melbourne sits on a great big Port Phillip Bay. There's a big bay and it's a huge bay. It takes about four hours to drive right around the bay or even longer than that. I'm wrong, about five, six hours. But you can go on a ferry and it will take you 20 minutes. The gap's really small. Boats come through there. So we are what we call Bayside. So we live right on the bay, um, just around from Melbourne on, on the bay. So it's a really, it is a really, really pretty spot. It's very, very nice. And how so, has your area inspired your work? Well, it's sort of lots of things. I've got to think about what is my work. Lots of things have inspired my work because uh, two, two, two factions, I suppose, in terms of design. I mean, I ended up with a patch workshop, as a lot of girls do, because it was my hobby, because I'm was a I'm a food scientist by trade, you know, so I did all of that. And then, um, then you have children and they get in the way of a 60-hour-a-week job. Just so so rude. Uh, my Just hobby so became rude. so rude. So I started teaching at home. I actually went out to advertise. I was going to teach at home when Stephen was 10 weeks old in a pram at a quilt show with little pictures of my house and cake and what I was going to teach. And he is now a burly uh, six foot two and 20 years old and runs my website and my wholesale business while at uni. So it's been, yeah, a very long journey and they've been with me. But once I started design, once we got the shop, it was all about, I wanted to do everything with a cultural influence. I didn't, I had such a little shop that I didn't want to just have a bit of everything. I wanted to have a real theme to it. And I love architecture and, and I love cultural influence textiles. So I thought, okay, um, we'll go on a journey around the world through our patchwork. So it's all cultural influence. So we tried, you know, we had Liberty, of course. We had Paisley's from Hoffman. There was, it was really hard going and then all the orientals started coming in kind of bay and robert kaufman and then it started to build but then the girls walked in the shop and said where's the australian stuff we want australian fabrics and we found there was this massive gap in the market for good quality ones there was a few around that were a bit like a souvenir two dollar tea towel kind of look um so i uh, had a friend teach me how to botanical draw and then just spent a couple of years trying to trying to get my head around it. But because I sold so much Robert Kaufman, and you know how they've got that formula where they've got a border, a large print, a medium, a coordinate, like it, it was quite structured in the way they did things. We tried, tried that. Anyway, 
long story short. And that gives you a nice basis to be able to design your own stuff as well, because you know that yeah, the formula uh, works really well. It works. And the international director for Robert Kaufman was in Australia and said, who's your biggest seller of, of Kaufman? And, and um, the distributor said, she's in Melbourne. So he flew down and met me. I showed him what I had and he said, finish it and send it to me. And I didn't. It was another year. And Rob said, God's sake, get on a plane. Just go to it. Go to a trade show. You're going to go anyway and see if you can get in to see them. So I went all the way to Pittsburgh for a five-minute meeting. Well, I didn't know how far it was to get to Pittsburgh. I landed in LA. It was like 30, was say, 32 hours. How far is it? How far <laughs> is it? I've never been to Pittsburgh, uh, so I don't know. It's, just, it's way over the other side. It, I think it took me about 28 hours. And I'd never been to America before. So um, that was good. So I got there and um, I took the folder. And what, what you can do with Australian flowers, and these are all botanicals under the Australian sun, what you can do with them is relate so many of them to oriental flowers. So big waratah flowers. I'm going to look for them now. Big, wait, wait, I can do it. Uh, I'll do it off this one. Big, this is new artwork anyway, but big, can you see that okay? The light's shining a bit bigger. So big waratahs, I said, well, they would be like large chrysanthemums. Kangaroo paws would be like orchids. Um, flowering eucalypt would be like cherry blossoms. So I tried to, anyway, long story short, they said, yes. Yeah. So that was really weird and wonderful all at the same time. So we've got that botanical range and I designed for them um, um, for about eight years under license and we did under the how Australian Sun work? and then I got to do so how, how does, does it work, work? designing under well, license sorry how do we do it well it's it's an interesting symbiotic relationship that you know what you want to design they know what their market demand is and you have to hope that those two things marry up together and it was extremely challenging being an Australian doing it not being stateside it was really hard work so um so I got a pussycat at the window no no round the other side use the tradesman's entrance so she sorry no, she's going at the window oh we've got a show on let me in let me in God, she's such a stage animal so um they it's really it's a gamble every time because you might spend four to six months designing a collection and hoping they'll take it so sometimes you would do a lot of work and they'd go yeah we love all of that but can you throw this in or we'll take that out or so I had I had a really good run and I learned a lot I worked under a lady called Evie Ashworth who's the director of um, uh, development and design at Robert Kaufman and she was an amazing mentor. I've never been in awe and so uh, terrified of someone all at the same time. She, um, she was incredible to work under. And, and that's really what it feels like now with her team. But, um, but you, don't have, you don't have full control. You know, you, that's, I think that's where Rob and I got to in the end. We wanted to launch Melba and it didn't fit into their program and they didn't know when they were going to do it. And we were on the waiting on the waiting list for nearly 18 months um and then we went to them and said okay how about you print it for us which they did they printed it for us and then after that we wanted another run and they went hang on she's going to come into america and compete with us so maybe we won't print another run for her so we were at trade show in america and we'd sold a second print run to america and then they started putting the barrier up so at that point um, we had to do a lot of soul searching and a lot of secret squirrel spy stuff to find out how, who, what to print my fabric. Uh, and a we did really it. really big thing to have done because, you know, Robert Kaufman, you could have maybe not done exactly what you wanted to, but you would have been guaranteed collections for, you know, yes. in perpetuity because these designers, they do end up having collections over and over again. But it's the balance of what your creativity is. That's a big move. Yeah, that's right. And there's a lot of other complications that come into it. So um, I, you know, I, it, was, it was never going to come to me. I can do a collection, but then it goes to different distributors around the world. And unless those distributors want that range to pick up all the volume, they won't take it on. Um, and I think at the time as well, and I'm probably speaking out of school, but 
you know, they've got to pay a designer. So if they if they think that, uh, and I think at that point that Kaufman were going that really trend away from traditional stuff like mine and Peggy Tools, you know, the real heavy shaded, quite intricate, traditionally designed fabric, they were starting to go towards more modern. They were doing more with kind of solids. Um, they had taken, just taken on McKenna Ryan who didn't stay long and went back to Hoffman. So um, Jennifer Sampu had just come back from living in Mexico um, and she's still designing for them. So there was a lot of change and they were really trying to take themselves into a more contemporary style to compete with Riley Blake and those sort of companies, you know, Lewis and Irene were coming on the scene. So they were changing their focus. So why pay a designer per yard for fabric? Um, if they can do it in-house. So I think think that's where it was kind of going at the time. But we it's, look at, it's an we interesting were ready to point do it. You we raised, to take it on. It's an interesting point you raised there because you're quite right. You've got all these massive conglomerates of, of fabric companies all coming up with new ideas, new ways of doing things, trying to keep it fresh, trying to keep the customer engaged, trying to make the fabric more different and to be able to make it profitable for the distributors and the shops yeah. and the yeah. end user making things that they love. Exactly. That's a really fine balance to be able to do. And I'm, yeah. in this industry, I don't know, there are a handful of people who have made, you know, good money on this. But if you look how many thousands of different designers there are and the people who've actually made it, you can probably count on one hand people who actually make a proper good living out of doing what you and I both oh, do. Oh, absolutely. And, and any international designer, I mean, there's been, uh, you know, there's a, there's a few Aussies, Australians now that design for companies in the US and, um you know, we'll be the first to tell you there's actually no money in the design process for us because it's expected and, and you have to get on a plane and fly to America to help. Well, a, a royalty check pay, just pays for the ticket. It doesn't, it's not an ongoing, you know, it, it's there's no money in that. It's what you do after that. I'm wondering um, how things have changed post the pandemic, though, because obviously what used to be a person-in-person -person meeting, for two years you couldn't have that, and business had to... I know. Time. So I'm oh, wondering I'm so how big... things, things haven't changed now with Zoom and all of that and Teams and all that. I wonder how it's changed. Oh, every, absolutely everything's changed. Oh, it, it didn't change as dramatically for me because I'm used to not seeing my... So I, so my, my, sorry. So what I have is um, a fabric agent team and they're based in LA. And then from there, it goes to, um, I, I don't even know, it's more like, an, it's like a, a support business, if you like. There's an art studio in, in, um, in Osaka that is an independent company, but they subcontract in, I, I think that's how it works, into the factory. So I've got one, two, I've got three steps that we go through. And interestingly, when I was with Robert Kaufman, I didn't know about the fabric agent. Kaufman never told me in eight years that they existed. I was always led to believe they went straight through to the factory. So I never knew about detour. Um, and uh, it was it was a, a weird and wonderful experience. It's like finding out you had a lost sister, really, and I'm an only child. That's how big that would be. Um, to have someone walk up to my booth at market, and I was I went and asked someone for help because we we were there and we knew we could see we had a problem. We had a meeting at Coffin back in LA after market, and I went and asked a mate for help. And he said, I'm not the guy, but I'll go and get you the guy. And he brought the guy to my stand and he stood there and he looked at my stand and he went, this is Melba and you're Lisa Chandler. And I went, and who are you? And he was this fabric agent in the middle and he knew me intricately, all my artwork, my emails and everything. But he was an honourable man and that was the confidentiality that we run under like the CIA and I never knew he was there. So you know it's so we is, sort of have is he still problem. there yes he's my back yes he's still there he's wonderful oh, I love um it. but i have this beautiful team that is so skilled and in america like you know you're right we we communicate there's five people in that company i communicate with on different things and it will be the logistics of getting stock out of the factory in japan or it's um finalizing artwork or it's coloring like they're all different skills but yes, with the pandemic, things have all changed. So three of them now don't work in the office. One's in Georgia, one's in New York, uh, and we do it 
you and I now. So, you know, people face to face now more in some cases than they did like on Zoom than they did before. They used to just have everyone on speakerphone. Now we all do the camera thing. And it's so much better. Because- and it works really well because my my husband does part of this as well. And what happens is they send a box of samples out to all the people coming into the meeting. So you've all got the same product to look at and play with to be able to say, right, that's the wrong color. This is the right color. That's the wrong color. And you can match it to your Pantone cards and get everything yeah. perfect and match it all together. So there are ways yeah. of making it work. So it'd be interesting to see post pandemic how this all comes together. There is, when we work, right? So when we used to work pre pandemic with emails, I could literally say it would always take 10 times longer to get the end result compared to when we sit down together in Houston and we all squirrel off into the little meeting rooms before market starts and, you know, we walk in the door with the big Starbucks and then, what are you doing, Pussycat? We all get the big meeting, you know, with the Starbucks and we're in there for six hours and it's all on. And then we can do everything so much in that time. However now you know we can do it like this all the time we don't need to we don't need to I think we've got a lot more official at communicating visually yeah. than, than we ever did before um, what's like extraordinary I, is if you look back five years and you we're here now can you imagine where we're going to be in five years time it's extraordinary it is extraordinary I, I, you really do wonder I mean I don't know what London's like but definitely Melbourne you know the property values and everything are all getting very sidetracked now property values and everything are dropping because people just don't need their offices anymore it was we were talking about it this weekend that we sold our place in London and pre-pandemic versus when we sold it we probably lost about a hundred thousand pounds on the property and then when we bought out in the home counties which is much more rural much more beautiful the property prices were a hundred thousand pounds more than what we were looking pre-pandemic so <laughs> people who moved out of London to the home counties have lost an absolute fortune but yeah it is what it yeah, is that's why we haven't gone country yet we're um, we're about we're probably a good year behind we'll go next year well it is what it is you can't change it yeah. Hey, John, can I show you something funny? Hmm? Um, sorry, in terms of in this whole process of, you know, we go through, um, and I don't know if the girls are interested or not, but the, the whole process we go through goes through the fabric agent, and sometimes the message doesn't get across properly. <laughs> so we had sampled, I have to show you, Jeannie, so I've got that around my legs. Um, um, this is the latest colour of Under the Australian Sun. This one, right? And so we sent the brief off to the factory of what the colour of the background was and what the colour of the flowers was. And we included in the pack a sample of one of the previous ones that had red flowers so that they could, you know, just so everyone was on the right page. But they, they missed in translation. So we got the green, but we got it with red on it. <laughs> so we open it up and you go oh and you go wait a minute that's Hold on. beautiful so um this this has been kept because this is the we're going to use this color story when we do the scottish french so um we're doing that the scottish french so wonderful that a happy accident then makes it into another happy collection. Accident. can you see this bit down here can you see that so that's what, um, when, when you look at, you know, when, if girls know, when they look at their selvage on their fabric and it's got all the little dots, they're all the screens that have been printed. But when we're still in the development stage, we actually get them as big swatch tabs um, because we need to be able to see them a lot better and we might need to match them to a Pantone textile reference book or something like that. So we get those and then they get taken off and put on something called a pitch sheet. And a pitch sheet is all of the tabs and we can cut them out and put them on and we can go 20% lighter, 10% darker and we can mess with them. So, um, yeah, so that's my happy mistake. But, um, yeah, the pandemic's messed with us a lot. We had to put a lot on hold. We, all, we had some things we had to go through with, but our wholesale market just stopped overnight. So we've slowly built up. Chandler's Cottage again um, as our retail business as you know. So some people may not know the different arms of your businesses so do you want to tell people a bit about that? Oh okay so there's two 
two main arms. Chandler's Cottage started, is 20 years old this year. Yes, there is a, there is a quilt in a cookbook coming, I promise. Sometime this year for the 20th. So it's, it's 20 years old because Steve's 20 years old. Um, and that's run through various stages of online. And we had a shop for nine years and then we had a showroom in our warehouse. And then when we, me, rang Robert um, on a, getting on a plane from LA to Utah, said, Robert, we've got a problem. We've got a big problem. Uh, we're going to have to do something because we've got a problem with printing and we think we're going to have to go out on our own. So uh, we sold the house <laughs> and we built a warehouse um, and we formed a second company called the Textile Pantry. So all my fabric now has um, the textile pantry on it. So that is our wholesale business. So we run, we run kind of both in parallel. So Textile Pantry only has what we design uh, in it, we don't distribute for anyone else. So it's all my fabrics and our giftware, and you know, we do lots of little giftware things because they're Australian. And the, and the scarf. So we do these, you know, and it's because they're Australian flowers, they have a souvenir market as well. I don't wear it quite as well as Natasha, she wears it well. But <laughs> so we. The height, you, know, you see, she can get it flowing. <laughs> Um, so we have, we do, we have two elements and I think that sort of developed as well because we sort of saw in our shop that people would come in with their friends that don't patchwork and they'd stand there and go, what are we going to do? So we used to stock a lot of giftware as well. Um, people would come to us if they were on holidays, you know, so they'd have friends or family with them. So the giftware is another element. So the textile pantries, all of our fabrics and my patterns that we design and uh, giftware, um, bag furniture. So we do all this stuff now as well. Like now, as you know, so we do all this stuff. And then we design all the bags that you use them for. So all, all of that fits under the textile pantry. And it's, they, you know, T Chandler's Cottage stocks a lot of other things besides our own things. But primarily, of course, the, the aim is eventually that it mostly just stocks what, what we do. But it's about giving the girls variety. They, you know, it's all, it's all about having different things. Not everyone likes the same stuff. Um, but when we do textile pantry is, is uh, where our focus will be now moving forward, you know, now that things are opening up again, because um, as you know, we're chipping into the UK. Yes, um, I know, but the others don't. Go and tell them, tell them. So do you want me to tell them? Oh, okay. So Jonathan, did a little bit of matchmaking last year, or the year before, early last year, and because he thought that Natasha from Natasha Makes and I were peas in a pod, as does my husband now. So she can't tell us apart except for the accent. So, um, <laughs> so Natasha is going to be distributing um, for the textile pantry in the UK, which is a lovely, it's, it's a lovely relationship, I suppose, because it's a lot like me, you know, she knows the product really well now, she's worked with it, she understands it, she she gets what goes together and, and, and knows me and how it ticks. So that is really exciting. And we, you know, I we had a couple of goes, uh, we were there with you at um, trade show, um, but it didn't happen because what was that? Brexit and a few other things. So it's it's lovely. And you know, if Melba, if Melba belongs anywhere to me, it belongs in the UK. Because always to me, the brief for designing Melba was that if Dame Millie Melba, who the range is inspired by from my childhood, and William Morris had spent a night together in the House of Liberty, this would be their love child. That is, that's you know. And so for Melbourne to be accepted in the UK has been um, very humbling and, and really nice. Do you want to see the new colour? Uh, no. <laughs> of course I want to. I haven't done a lot. All I've done is taken the pinks. <laughs> I've taken the pink and I've put it onto black. So that's, uh, that's the new one. And um, we, it, you know, it goes with, so then we've got all the little fans that go with it. So that's the fan print. We've got it in pink and silver. And John, I did, I did, I took the silver 
and I just did it in a little floral as well because uh, we needed one. So it's just pretty, pretty. Can you see that okay like that? Yes. So it's just, you know, it's slowly building to the range as well. And uh, going back to the wholesale thing, things happen that you don't expect. So this little fan that's on this bag, we did that to go with, oh, we'll go this way, to go with this. Can you see it's actually that little, it's that little fan that's on there. We did that for ourselves, but then what happened was everyone started using it as an oriental print. So um, now we're just expanding it into its own collection. There's a periwinkle coming, a periwinkle. And then that will go with my Japanese range coming. So that's it. Um, but, you know, wholesale is different. You have to do stuff like this, John, right? So, so we do little folders. So these go out to the reps in America and around Australia, and we send them to stores. And it's got all the colours inside. So we design all this in. So we design all this in house. So it's a lot of work, and you know, we put you have to put the real cloth in so they can feel it, and you put all the colours in. So that's that. And then we do them with you know. I'm sorry, so I'm like this because oh my goodness, yeah. I want a pamphlet, please. How do I get a pamphlet, please? You want that, right? Okay. So so this sort of stuff. This is this I suppose is where we're really different that we and mad at the same time that we do everything here from designing the fabric through to printing it, then sending it out and then selling it through the reps and then selling it into the shops and then, then we sell it as well. So we do everything from design through to end user. And then you've, as you know, you've got to have all the patterns to back it up. Do you have a favourite process that you love? Because you literally do everything from the botanical drawings as the, the main feature, and then you're doing the designing of the fabric, then you're distributing it, then you're making it, then you're showing people how to do it, and you're actually selling it. What's your favourite bit of all of it? Designing it. I can say that because... Well, it's I, your baby. It's my baby, but also I can't design. I can't design, so... In my head, I'm not. So it's really weird to Sorry, me. Sorry, did you just say you can't design? No, no, what do you mean you can't design? You've been doing it for how many years? I'm a food scientist. I'm not a textile designer. <laughs> so this weird magical thing happens. If I get in the right zone with the right loud music, and I've got really bad hearing at the moment, I've got bad ringing in my ears, and I think I've done it because it's, it's music, and I've got to put myself in the right environment, and I sort of... I've learned that if you play loud music, it removes your inhibition in some ways to actually draw or your hesitation. So to me, that's the magic bit at the start. After that come the tears and the tantrums and the throw it in the floor and everything, but the design bit and the research, the research for me to design a range when it's, when it's cultural is, you know, that's, that's the amazing bit. And then I jump to the end where, um you just steal yourself you just steal yourself away at some point or you'll be at a show and someone's used your fabric in a quilt and that's that's the other end the bit in the middle I'm not sure about but you know these so so you I know you know the story but um mum my mother Pam was befriended by Dame Millie Melba's granddaughter Lady Pamela Vesti um mum managed a gift shop and um Pamela Vesti used to come in and buy things. And one day she said, would you like to come out? <laughs> would you like to come over for morning tea? Well, mum and I couldn't scramble out the door quick enough because uh, she, Lady Vesti, of course, still lived at Dame Nellie Melba's house, which is Coombe, Coombe Cottage. So we got to go through the big iron gates behind the big cypress fence, you know, this house hidden away. And she was absolutely wonderful. So we got to spend time, uh, you know, on more than one occasion there. And there was no inhibition with her. And I could wander and look. And we went through Dame Ellie Melba's bedroom, you know, and her wardrobe is still full of dresses uh, with silk panels to let the fabric breathe. And there was still hair in her hairbrush. And there was still, oh God, it was just, you know, a very, very spooky kind of, experience but it was it was wonderful um and it's all open to the public now and you can go through and have a look so there were elements so she really inspired me 
to do it because it's 1920s and I wanted an Art Nouveau stylized Australian print. So I took a lot of the colours from her house. So the um, mom, 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 these colours over here, these are sort of her bathroom colours and things and there's um, the silk panels in her bedroom with that beautiful soft teal. So I tried to incorporate it in. But then her father, um, Major Mitchell, built um, our Royal Exhibition Buildings in Melbourne for Queen Victoria's World Exhibition. It's one of, I think, only two of those buildings that still stand. And it's magnificent. So I took a lot of the elements out of this. So, you know, under the dome is octagonal and a lot of this work and the plaster friezes and things have all come from that building. So I think that's what I loved on is having a little bit of um, history or architectural integrity to the fabric. That's, you know, that's what I love. So what I did with the Indian range and Dutch and um, yeah, and we're doing, we're doing one called, I thought we, we, me, doing one called uh, Silk Road and that will take in, or, well, you know, a lot of the ones we've already done through India and China, um, you know, in Russia and up through all that area on the Silk Road that we've already done and we'll add some more into it at the same time. So that's coming up. And then we, me, <laughs> I was saying we, it's like I've got this huge team, not, um, we're t uh, and, and after discussing it with Natasha and you too, you know, because it's all about, it, it's really nice being able to run stuff by people as well. I'm not sure how the Scots will feel about me doing a Scottish range, but I'm going to give it a go. So we're going to take Mel the structure of Melba, the stylized Melba, um, and because I'm an old, I'm an old fash girl. There's no computers or anything. They're all drawn and painted. I don't do anything on. I, I let them. I let other people do that bit. I just draw them. So these will become thistles. So we'll have thistles and heather and um, the tile print. We'll do Tudor roses and Celtic knots and things. And then we'll do an English range botanical as well. So that's that's all on the board at the moment. But um, yes, it's been a ride, John. It's been a ride. But you must be designing months and months and months in advance of things. So all of those things you've just mentioned, you're obviously drawing them, slowly going deaf in the process, <laughs> but getting it all done. How long does this take? Um, so what? What tends to happen is, so I will make notes for a long time. I won't actually start drawing. Uh, so there's a lot of notes that are, that are written up. Um, there's scaling done as in, I'll, I'll decide now, you know, if we're gonna do the same with the border stripe, are they the same width? So I'll do all that sort of stuff first and a lot of research first, but to put it actually down onto paper out of here and, and side notes, I'll lock myself away and I can do it in about a week and a half. So I will just drop everything. I've got a couple of places I can go. I've got a girlfriend with a house down the beach or I will, I've been known to lock myself in a hotel room. Um, I saw JK Rowling do that and thought it was a really good idea. So I did that once. So, uh, so I can do that. I did that with Summer Palace um, and I can knock it out pretty quick, but it's a lot of, that's the first bit to get the line drawings done. You need the outline, which on my fabric becomes metallic first. Um, the pro, the long, the lo wow, it's interesting now. I'm not sure. The, the longest part of the process is getting the artwork uh, developed, not so much by the, not so much my fabric team in LA, but by the art studio in Japan to get it to the point where I have to sign it off. When I sign off, no changes. That is line shading and allocation of a color. So it doesn't matter which color it is yet, but it's gonna go here, 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 and here. That's usually the longest process. However, since pandemic, things seem to have sped up. And I think, I think what's happening is that my particular factory, which is, oh my goodness, amazing, I mean, there's only two factories in the world, I think, including mine, and they're both in Osaka about five kilometres apart that can do what, what my fabric has on it. So 16 screens, the metallic, the quality, they digital, they airbrush in between screening, they're amazing. Um, I think a lot of companies are feeling the pinch and they're moving away from these really high-end quality factories. Uh, I will never leave, I will never leave, because I just, 
I couldn't, I couldn't. Um, they're too good. I couldn't. But on top of so, that, you spent years developing the process and the relationships and the quality is so Oh, absolutely. Important. And your absolutely. fabric that doesn't have that quality and the airbrushing and all of that, it's not going to be as good. No, no. Um, no, that's right. It's, they've got to stay. And what I've got coming up, I need what they've got. I mean, we've got a, uh, you know, my Oriental Baltimore that Natasha's been doing. That's the Japanese range. I've turned it into a panel. So it's it's actually coming out as a big square panel with flowers top and bottom so you can create it 3D. And then it comes with a an ombre background foliage print. Well, I can't do that anywhere else. It has to be there. They're the only ones that'll get it right. They're the only ones. So I don't mess with that. Are you at a risk of potentially losing them though? Because this is what I'm really concerned about is that we do have a lot of people veering away for cross cutting and the threat, the cotton's not as good. You know, mode has moved on to Japan and to different things. We know that it's cost, but you can feel the difference in the fabric when it arrives. It's still the same price, mm -hmm. but you can definitely feel the difference in the quality of the fabric. I've, yeah, so when when we, um, ah, John, I had so much to learn when I took over. It was quite frightening. Um, and, and, you know, and that's that's my relationship and my, and my friendship with my fabric agent team. They've been so patient with me. Um, you know, when I first took over and we went off to do, what are we doing? Oh, what were we doing? Summer Palace. Okay, so we're going to run it at a 60 degree angle, double drop, reverse. I'm going, what, what, what are we talking about? I don't know what we're talking about. And they'd go, okay. And the next minute, you know, an email had come through with all these YouTube links and <laughs> explanations and everything for me. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm not too sure what's going to happen, but we, we have a specification that they have to run to for our cloth. So it's, you know, thread count, weight, composition, and, and also where the, where the thread, where the cotton stock comes from. So it's all very interesting. My cotton stock comes out of Korea. Most of it's grown in Korea but it's not processed in Korea. It goes raw into Japan. Whereas a lot of the others are processed, processed in Korea and then go to Japan. And then you've got a lot of whole processing, the whole thing's done in Korea. So there are different levels. Um, and there is, a, there is a massive price structure attached to that. You know, a lot, a lot of dosh um, involved in, in those three different steps. So, I um, mean, cotton, as we talked about, raw cotton prices have doubled in the last six months, so we have no idea. And they look, they may go down again. I, we don't know what's going to happen. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of difference. Do you know, it was interesting when I was at Co uh, with Kaufman, they, um, uh, there was a breakaway group, breakaway section uh, from one of the Japanese companies. They actually picked up a whole team and they put them into Korea. Uh, same team, same system, same everything, but they were working with uh, Korean cotton and you could pick it, you could pick it. So Imperial Collection, Robert Kaufman, Japan, Oriental Traditions, Korea. That you could always pick the difference in the base cloth between them. Well, it's, it's been an amazing, it's been an amazing ride and we still, we're still learning all the time because we keep trying to challenge ourselves to try you know, different things um, and trying to cater to, you can develop a fabric range, but then who's going to use it? You know, and, and how? <laughs> and how? So you're going to do, you've got to do, you know, pattern wise, uh, when you distribute or you first promote with shops, you've got to provide free patterns. I will not provide digital created ones. I refuse to do it. They have to be real quilts. Um, and so that is a bit of a challenge for us but I like a real quilt or a real project but we try and do you know we try and do everything um you know we go little things for beginners you know to start with and then you have to look after the EPP girls so you have those sort of projects then you got to can you see that then we got cushions these are coming through to net next I think where we do cushions because every, then you got to do the home day course so you do cushions and bed runners and then you got to do table runners and then you've got to do it so you just you work your way up but of course when you start I'm sure the girls get that when you start it's all about volume you've got to get the volume through first because when we print 
per design, we're printing um, 3,000 yards. So that's 2,700 meters per design. It's a lot of fabric. Oh. Minimum, that's the minimum. And 600 per color. So you've got to be able to give the shops quilts that are going to get through, you know, at least half what they sell or half what they buy. And then as time goes on, you can go back and do more complicated, you know, more complicated appliques and things with them. So you've got to spread yourself. You've got to look after the bag makers, um, quilts, easy ones like this that run off charm packs like this one here. So you've got to, you know, really, you've got to look after everyone. You've got to do something with stitchery because a lot of people are patchworkers that want to do a little bit of stitchery or they're embroiderers and they're not really into patchwork. So you have to do stuff like this, you know, with really simple stitchery. That's my sashiko orata. So you I've just, never seen that. Have it yet? Oh, have you seen this one then? Um, and then, you know, you watch stores, sh sorry, oh, talking American, shops love having things they can run as workshops. So beginners machine applique, really important. And then the bag assembly is really easy as well. Or this will be an extension of a free download so that they can start off with that and get the girls in to do stuff. So it's just, yeah, there's a lot of thought, a lot of thought process between designing. It's just, that's the easy bit, buddy. It's but what my favorite thing has been about your fabric is you end up with so many people buying the fabric and then sitting with it and thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. And I've run a couple of stack and whack classes with your fabrics and oh my goodness, that one that you've just picked up, that black and gold, that as a stack and whack, the way the method that we use is extraordinary because the way people well, come one. up with different ideas, I know it was the one just which is a bit more open. I think it's the border yes. fabric and the quilt behind yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, yeah. extraordinary to see how people had come out because you did that one as a big continuous print with a, I think it was a 24 or 36 inch repeat. And just yeah. seeing how people have come up with different ideas and how to use it. That's my favorite bit of your fabric. This, this, um, well, as, as time goes on, you know, as I said, people, you that get fabric, to do more yes. complicated. That fabric See there. that? Yeah, that's good. This, this was made by the same very talented girl that did the shoes. Um, and she, I loved this so much. Um, I made her, I made her let me do it with royalties for her. And I've probably only done royalties for someone probably twice. Um, but I love this. This is called the Madison set. So she did, I love it because it's classic. And that was, this range is called classic. So it's just, look at that, really lovely. She's the pocket in the front. And then inside that, you've got your bow clutch with a zipper. And you've got your glass case. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous. I love it. Um, and this is the rewarding bit, you know, when I see people knock things out like this that are just, you know, I don't know if you can, John, can you see, can you see that okay there? Yep. I don't want to put it down. So this is another whole element um, that we're, we're entertaining the thought of. Uh, now that I'm not uh, doing machine dealership at the moment, um, not as big an incentive, I suppose, but machine embroidery, because, you know, there's a lot of girls out there that, because I've owned the art files, I can knock out machine embroidery designs as well to go with it. So it's and I, just, honestly, I think machine embroidery is picking up so much at the moment. It's been wonderful. Is it in the UK? Yeah. Well, well, about and, and just before the pandemic, when I went through, I did a road trip through Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Ontario, that whole area. So it's only a small pocket. But every single one of those stores had the digital CDs for all these amazing, amazing embroidery designs. And it was something I've not seen in this country a lot. I've, you see one oh, shop will have it, those. but it yeah. is extraordinary to see what people make out of it. And I well, may is... or may not be needing you to, if you are tempted and you need design pattern testing, I may or may not have a little quilt in mind. If you are interested, we could do our very first yeah. elaboration there, Mrs. We could, we could. Oh. Well, I've, the other one, the other one I've done, it's not, um, from the other, the other one I've done is the dragons. So this one here, that's been actually done as a machine embroidery design. So you can stitch your dragon out. So um, this is out because I have to make a bag out of it because I actually bought a pair of shoes 
Well, if only you knew a wonderful bag maker who you've done royalties for. I know. I was... to have two different types yeah. of bags. Hey, we've now, done if it. anybody wanted to buy patterns like that, I know Natasha stocks a lot of your patterns. Does she have yes. all of them? No, not yet. So that she bag, does, well, for example, behind you, if somebody wanted to make the other one, the one that you did royalties with your, those ones, if somebody that wanted that design, how does that work? Oh, well, well, Stevie, the baby, that's no longer a baby, with my beautiful new website, um, we have digital downloads. So you can... And that website it. is... Oh, www.chandlerscottage.com. There on you your go. screens now. For proper uh -huh. product placement, please repeat that. www.chandlerscottage.com. I'm trying to be terribly mod uh, American with the QVC thing is, I'm your now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mainly because that yes. bag is actually something that I would make for myself because I love a good messenger bag. I love it. Yeah, I, I I like the satchel style ones myself. I really, yeah, I really like them. And look, see, we even did we did lampshades. It's ridiculous, Jonathan, but it's it is. Um, I think the challenge too for us is because we've decided to keep a fabric range going as long as we have. Uh, and it's you know it's a baby under the Australian sun. It's just like part of the family. It's you know you just can't imagine. It sounds stupid, but life without it like like your favorite couch or your favorite car or something our fabric range is um you know been with us for so long as part of our lives but we have to keep reinventing and we have to keep tweaking and we have to keep adding new things in and also challenging people to use it in different ways so uh yeah it's not normal to have a fabric range around for 12 years it's just not right but there are I've got new, 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 new things that you will like coming to go with this. There's a nice wall hanging to coming to go with this. Um, and uh, what you said about stack and whack, that is going to definitely go into that thing that you and I do with the octagons and stuff. So, yes, that will happen. But so it's an exciting get... future, but now we need to know when are we actually going to see you in the UK again? I know, I was going to say, I can't wait to get back. <sighs> Not really, because obviously, just, uh, well, just to hang out. with you and Natasha, <laughs> never mind the festival. <laughs> but the because obviously on the trade side of things, we as the shop, we've got the potential of having you at Stitches in February, don't we? Oh, you threw that one in. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's what the plan is. I'll, tell, I'll give you the plan. You know, it's only between you and me and all of you girls. Only about five that. people <laughs> watching us, so you're fine. <laughs> The plan, the plan is, so So we've decided not to do festival this year. Um, Rob and I, the gorgeous man, who is the other part of this business, of course, of course, uh, who who has been in it since day one, um, we, we have some life plans that need to be taken care of that COVID kind of got in the way of. And the boys are, you know, both, both do work for us now, but they're not here. So we need to get ourselves organised this year so that we can relocate. Uh, country like you next year so there's a lot of plans and travel and everything you know it's a long way to the UK <laughs> so I've only done Australia once but I'm and I did the go 12 hours to Hong Kong spend 24 hours yeah, and yeah. then go 12 hours again and I promise you that last 12 hours I'm like I'll just live in Hong Kong it's just easier yeah. <laughs> so I'll just live in Hong Kong, it's just easier. You yeah. are very far away. And now yeah. there's that flight that you can go, I think it's from Sydney, direct to London on one flight, 21 yeah. hours on the plane. I'm, I'm not sure I've got that capacity. I'm not sure. Okay, I can tell you from experience doing the LA trek or whatever. Once you pass the first 10, it just doesn't matter anymore. You just, well, at that point, gone. you're like, do I just die here? Do I just, I just <laughs> That's I don't care. Do what you like. <laughs> I'm on an aeroplane. So, so. Yes. Yeah, so, it, look, no, no offense. It's not a personal thing, but we may not come this year. Now, the other thing, too, um, and, and, and you know, we were in Spain when the pandemic hit in 2020. So, we had a very big trip planned. Um, we were doing the Stitches show uh, with my main shop. You know, flew into Madrid, went down to Valencia, got it all ready, got in the car, went to Stitches, and they shut us down at about 4.30 the night before the show opened. So, and then we sort of, being being Australians, we went, she'll be right. 
we'll go bush. So, you know, we sort of kept changing our plans and thought we could just travel around little villages for a while. No, no, no. Three days later, we were curtailing it in a two-door Peugeot back to Madrid airport and haytailing it home. So, so for us, what we what we want to do, and I'm sure everyone would get everyone would so many people would be the same as us. We just want to go back and pick up where we left off. So our first plans to uh, come up north again will be the Citrus Show at the end of March next year. If if oh John, if we had to go to Houston, if we you know if oh we it'd had, be terrible, uh, and you know I if I have to meet you there, you know I've already oh. twisted Andrew's arm and. No, may or may have, not have got sign off for that as well. Oh God, but the best Nouveau Mexican oh. restaurant, if we go, it's fantastic. Well, so if we good. are going to go, let's get this with Natasha. Let's get a nice big Airbnb because I've been doing an Airbnb circuit around there. We can walk to the bloody show. It's on. Okay, so plan B, that is the plan B. Plan A um, uh, will be Spain. And then what I would like to do next year is, is when we come, it'll be big. So, you know, we'll be in the UK and Rob will be with me. We'll be in the UK for at least two weeks with festival, hang with you, Natasha, whatever, whatever she wants to do, what you guys want to do, we'll just do it. That's fine. Look, we've got the wall room for... here. You've got space to park your rental car. You can come and DOS here as well. So you've got places. Oh, nice. It'll be fun. We, there's a brief trip required to York uh, to a very good oh, friend. Oh, how dreadful. That is... I hate York. I'll definitely not come with you for that one. Do you know what? She turned oh, her butler's York. pantry in her old, old cottage into oh. a gin bar. We are so there. Oh my god! And York, it may be the same place. They've got the most amount of gins in the country in the one shop in York. The best like gin shops ever. Twenty of them. So, so I carefully carry, you know, from Australia, a my little bottle of Four Pillars gin, which is from um, my hometown for yep. her. And I arrive, and she goes, "Now, what would you like to drink? Would you, would you want a G and T?" Or I've gone because the first time I'd met her, G and T. I looked at her and said, "Oh, well, hello. I bought you this." And she's gone, "Come with me." And we walk out into this old pantry. And the pineapple fairy lights are up and the umbrellas are there and there's gin. And I've just gone, I love this girl. We are friends for life. Well, Do you know what she problem, does? The problem with moving is we had gin in London. We had gin in Tring. We had gin in my house and in storage. And then when we moved into this house and put everything together, there was a lot of gin. And I will not you know divulge how many, but it was over 100 different bottles of gin. If you'd like to add to the fact, you know what her job is? She's the manager of Arnie Betty's largest tea rooms in York. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so we're going to go to York. Um, but yes, let's let's do something really big. And um, if I am in as Cuba. well, could you not do Spain in sort of mid-November? This year? Yeah. Because <laughs> then you can go to Houston, do oh, that. Yes, and then go from there. You can go straight to Natasha. You could do a whole week of shows for Natasha. Well, what we're waiting on, seriously, what we're waiting on next year with Festival of Quilts is there's the September show in Madrid. So I, I'm, we may actually have to time it that we arrive just in time for festival, then do all our other stuff after, and then we can flick on to Madrid. Madrid's a big show. And then from Madrid, come to us, do the road tour of the England, and then we can go in October all the way to festival, uh, to Houston. It sounds like a terrible idea. I don't think any of us it's would It's a enjoy shocking it. idea. Who's running this business here while I'm gone? You have children. That's university have holiday time. Oh, true, true, true. <laughs> Not that anybody was interested in any of that. <laughs> but this is how we work. We do a whole bloody hour of chatting about how you know, to do this. Do you know, um, when we started talking about, when I talk, started talking about Spain on um Facebook Live, which you frequent every now and then, freak me out. So on, on Chandler's Cottage, I just sort of said, we're going to go to Spain. And someone, I, I said, that's when we'll go back. Oh, because Maria was watching. So Maria's store is filled with Fada and she's home-based, but does all the shows. So she's back out doing shows now. Um, and she said, yes, come. And I just went, okay, everyone, hands up. Who wants to come on the tour? Oh, I shouldn't have. <laughs> Within a day, emails. <laughs> Comments on Facebook and everything. I had a bus. <laughs> I had an absolute bus. But there's a but don't knock that idea because one thing that I found that's really I run retreats a lot, so I do five to yep. five to seven a year, and the community you build from those is actually 
it's the most one of the most rewarding things of, the, of my whole little Absolutely. empire that I'm slowly building but for you doing travel trips like that would be extraordinary and there are hotels that would put you up for 24 hour rates and 48 hour rates and you uh, can look, go and around look, and do that stitches stitches is beautiful they have all of all of the promenade right along the beach is all of the vendors tents and that's open till about three and then all the cool exhibitions are separately spaced out in old chapels and cathedrals and buildings all up through the medieval village it's just well beautiful. i think we need a travel arm on your sink you could do that and you could have all of your people get on the planes and meet you and they could do the shots of england I think you should take them i mean you'll know them better than me I'll just um, no, I mean, sit in the back seat. Ladies. I'll sit in the back seat. <laughs> I'll sit. I'm always a back seat girl. I'll sit in the back seat with the with the lollies, and you can you can do the. Love it. <laughs> you do the show. Oh, That'd be God. really good. For it and it, look, these this is you know this is um this is what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's you know now lockdown was uh, you know Melbourne we we did it long. We did how many days? A lot, three hundred and something over two years. No. um and and it I'm, I'm going to say this at the risk of offending people my you know if, if you do you use the term small village syndrome where you have people that live in a village and they don't go further than five feet it happens here as well it's so but there were a small town syndrome that people don't go beyond the border of their town sort of because they don't need to in, in their life they may leave three four times in a country outback town or something this is how we this is what we all became during lockdown once we were allowed out it's like we well, don't actually need to go anywhere and and <laughs> why why do you know so that whole it's taking you know australians we are adventurers we we don't really call ourselves vacationers we love adventure because we've we've got to get on a plane and get off an island to go anywhere you know it's new zealand's the closest and it's three and a half four hours away with a headwind on a plane uh, Singapore's eight, Hong Kong's eight, anywhere that we want to go, it's a, it's not a, a quick jump. So it's taking us a long time to um, come out of our shells again and, and contemplate going anywhere. So this is now what gets me up in the morning is uh, it, even if we are planning to do something together next year, it means I should be designing the fabric now because it takes that long to get it done so that's why the English stuff and the Scottish stuff and uh, oh I missed one there's a range called Valencia so with the tiles and the citrus and everything so that's why that's got to happen now because you did ask before we got totally sidetracked how long does it take it, anywhere from six to 18 months depending on how much refinement it needs so but that's important um, as well because that's where what you know why we have these conversations is where will you be traveling what do you need it for and if you are going to stitches what are you going to have to show are you going to have your cards ready will you have samples ready and that's it's it takes a year at least and there are so many things that you know get get lost lost i don't know or mislaid along the way i mean when we were at stitches i had planned a meeting with a distributor company that had just taken on Benina and because I was a Benina dealer and I'm a Benina girl, um, Benina had from Switzerland had set that up for me and we were going to talk and they were going to distribute in Spain because Spain is an oddity compared to distributing elsewhere. And I have a distributor in the Netherlands as well um, who hasn't done much during COVID, but I wanted Spain. And literally, the mayor came down, shut us all down and we looked at each other. We were about 10 metres apart and we both did this with our hands going, that's it we can't have the meeting we still haven't had the meeting you know so these things have just been waylaid and get in the way and uh, yes I like to look at it in a more esoterical way that it's not the right time and it's when it's meant That's to happen, it will happen yeah and also <clears throat> the cost of you leaving your business for two months you know that's a big cost you do live feeds once every week is it or once every two weeks mm, twice a week yeah, well, gosh, so we I didn't do... realize it was that many. But you know, things like that, that's revenue earning for you as well. That's a lot of orders to be packed and oh, packed. That's... And exactly. it's a lot. That's all... And you can't travel yeah. the world with enough fabric and bits and pieces to be able to do a live feed for two, to, you know. No, no that's right. 
No, but we're still, we're working really hard on making ourselves as uh, as mobile as possible. I mean, moving the business to just being online, which we was a huge decision to do, but during COVID, it wasn't that big a deal. <laughs> um, and now people are knocking on the door of my beautiful warehouse with my beautiful new tenants going, um, that's electrical goods, that's not fabric. <laughs> so, you know, it's very, it's hard to communicate to everyone all the time. That, a know, lot of people happening. aren't on social media. A lot of people haven't made that switch from one. And they don't read their emails. No, they don't but do it. A lot, you know, even some of the customers I have don't even have an iPad. They don't even have any form of te technology. No. Because unfortunately, quilters are of a generation that some are older. And if they don't have children, they don't have grandchildren who've helped them progress into that, they've been left behind. And it's it's very hard because you're not sure unless you actually see them to be able to help them and spend the time getting them onto social media and things. It's, it's and you've got to be there to support as well. It's very hard to be able to, and it's it's, it's yeah. exclusive in a way because for you and I, we've had no choice but to adapt. Absolutely. Otherwise, our businesses wouldn't have uh, would have well would have died. Yeah. Wouldn't would have died. Um, in in some ways, John, it, it's you're right, and it's interesting the way it goes. We either you know we either have the customers that have gone the full. We go to the customers have the full uh, experience, so they're they you know they're watching on YouTube. So we've got a YouTube channel and they're watching us live on Facebook and then we upload it to YouTube. And then like you, I run a, I run a Podia site. So I've got an online club. So I film and do demonstrations for those girls. Then I have private Facebook groups now for the girls doing my block of the month because uh, then I can give them extra information. And then now we've got another online class for another quilt that's actually not mine, a made of mine everyone wanted. So there's, there's filming going on in this room all the time. And I've got to get to the point now where I just go, I, uh, girls I'm sorry about the hair and the makeup but I just need to tell you this so you know I can't I can't do it all very showmanship all the time which they don't care but so in some ways we've gone to the extreme high tech and in other ways we've gone to the you know the other side as well so but it's nice you're able to yeah. do both because it's important to be able to have that aspect to give people if they need it yeah yeah we've had to be it's really hard you know and you would be the same we've had to be unfortunately really really firm I would love to have girls come to the house but you know if I'm in design mode or we're filling orders yeah. or whatever we just we can't do it I think when we leave here we may have we might have a large um moving sale under the grapevine <laughs> before we before we move house or just a one-off a one-off because then it won't matter mm -hmm. anymore but um, also you've got all the samples and you've got all the bits and bobs that you may not want to take with you and people would love that because they don't have to make it themselves it's a little piece of you as well uh, there's so much that I was looking around the room there are so many samples uh, a lot of them are at Natasha's at the moment <laughs> uh, a lot of a lot of them are there I may or may there. not have been able to go and see the Lisa's shelves where everything is all on one shelf and labeled and catalogued it, and everything I, I'm going to um, do a. I'm going to get to do a swapsie soon with Maria, yeah, because Maria's out doing shows again. So I want the Spain and the UK stock to do that, and then they then they all get something uh, something different. Mm. Um, it's really what you say is interesting. Some some samples I'm not attached to, but some samples I get a little bit um, mm. emotionally attached. So I think we're up to about there's four suitcases of quilts from my first quilt ever that you are never going to see, and um, yeah up to the ones that we've got now so and some of them are not my sentimental value um they're Rob's Rob's got Rob's got a couple that I cannot part with he loves them there's the wonky donkey quilt you heard about the wonky donkey quilt I haven't do you want to <laughs> you can cut this bit out you read the wonky donkey quilt so when um I designed passage to India which was the I don't remember now I think the first of the First of the Culture Club ones, and it had panels and, and things on it. And that's when I started getting shared in with Robert Kaufman because they said, oh, we're going to change your panel size because you haven't used the full width of fabric. So they're going to be 13, what, 13 and 5 eighths long by 11 and 3 quarters wide. And I said, if you give that to me and I give it to my customers, they're going to throw the fault back in my face. You put them back where they were. I'm quite happy with the extra bit of blank stuff, you know, all of that. Anyway, so they wanted samples for market and I was going and it was such a tight timeline. They So they just pulled it off, they pull it off the loom, gets dropped into a box and uh, and then they'd move the box away in the next one and they just, they just pile it all up in the same box for width in the FedEx and arrives at the door. 
and we were so wonderful and we cut it all up and we were cutting to the, the dimension like I do with Mel, but cut to the actual dimension on the fabric rather than a ruler because we knew what they all were and that was all fine. So we put the whole thing together. We went to lay it out and you get this quilting. We laid it out and the whole thing was, <laughs> was all wavy and buckled and going, what on earth? So there is so much that happens in that final process of setting a fabric when they double bolt it and when it's rolled that we that didn't happen. So resetting the weft and the weave and everything had not been done. So when they roll it tight onto a roll, I'm going to get you a roll. Hang on. I've got a narrow one here. When they, when they do this, when they do that, because of the way they pull it, it sets it this way. And then when they take this bolt, and it goes on a big sort of machine on the side and it brings it down like that and folds it and they wind it onto the bolt. It sets the other way and it straightens it to a great extent. Uh, and none of that had happened. So my passage to India, Mahal Magic Quilt has always been known as the Wonky Donkey Quilt. Um, and uh, I, pay, I pay a little extra and it's a, it's, a, it's a piddly little thing. It's like about three, four cents a yard which is actually not that piddly when it works its way down the... To, well, for 3,000 yards, that's quite a lot of money. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. But I get, particularly with panel designs um, and ones like the Melbourne Kaleidoscope, I get them to stand. I, have, I pay for someone to stand and make sure that fabric comes off into that bin straight. Because if you don't get it there, you know when you get panels and they arrive on the bolt and they're like, they do this, yeah. So, um, yes, I have wonky donkey quilts, but that's Rob's. That's Rob. I'm not going to get rid of that one. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's just the way it goes. But, yes, it's, um, it's been a very interesting ride so far. But it's not over. It's really only just started. Well, that's the thing. And I'm finding that as well, that you've just got so much that's coming forward. And I think, in a way, mm -hmm. lockdown gets you to stop certain aspects, evolve on certain others, and then really plan what you're going to do going forward for the rest of it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, So we're just going to have to hold on and wait and see you in a year's time or in a year and a bit. And you're going to be- Whenever it is, it's going to be epic. It's going to be epic. But the other side of it is, is that there's so much going to come with you and so much new and so many different things. It's really exciting. Yeah, and Terrifying. I'm bringing friends with absolutely terrifying. terrifying but it's it's just nice lisa thank you so much for joining me on this podcast it's been wonderful to have you now you can go and have your dinner i'm gonna have dinner i might have a gene you never know <laughs> all right darling, darling thank, thank you no, thanks thank everyone no, and thank you. Thank you so much for joining me, of course, along with John. It's so good to have you for another week. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.